Seven o'clock meeting of the Planning Commission will come to order. I have a roll call, please. David Bell, Margo Mari, Britton Sanders, here. Greg Sutton, here. John Scott Walker, here. Colleen Murphy White, here. Justin Nearman, here. All right, I believe we have uh, minutes from the January 13 meeting. Any discussion? Motion to approve. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, Ms. Ireland, any correspondence? None. All right, the new business PC 1-20. PC 120 is a concept plan for plat application. Owner is JWB Real Estate Capital, 7563 Phillips Highway, Suite 208, Jacksonville, Florida, 32256. Applicant is Alex Safakis with JWB Real Estate, address same as owner. Agent is Curtis Hart with Hart Resources, LLC, 8051 Terra Lane, Jacksonville, Florida, 32216. <coughs> Excuse me, the property location is 1304 First Avenue North, and the request is for a concept plan for plat approval for a proposed three lot B simple townhouse subdivision located in a commercial general C2 zoning district pursuant to section 34503 of the Jacksonville Beach Land Development Code. The subject property is located on the south side of First Avenue North between Penman Road and 11th Street North. The property was historically a single family residential use despite being located in a commercial zoning district, which does not permit single family residential uses. The applicant wishes to redevelop the property with a three unit fee simple townhouse project. The applicant received conditional use approval via PC 5-17 on February 27th of 2017 for multiple family residential in a C2 zoning district for the proposed three unit townhouse project. The applicant also received concept plan for plat approval in April of 2017, however, that approval has expired. The applicant's proposed plan shows three townhouse lots that meet the minimum RM1 townhouse lot size and street frontages. Adjacent property uses include single family to the north across First Avenue North, a vacant property to the east, commercial to the west, and commercial to the south along Beach Boulevard. The proposed three-unit townhouse project is consistent with the mixed-use character of the surrounding area, meets the RM1 zoning district requirements, and represents a transitional use between the commercial uses on Beach Boulevard and the single-family residential neighborhood to the north. All right, thank you, Ms. Ireland. Uh, just very briefly for those in attendance, uh, the manner in which we conduct these applications is that uh, staff will read uh, the application into the record as Ms. Ireland has done. Um, she could field any questions from the uh, commissioners at that point. Um, if the applicant's present, app applicant will come forward, be sworn in, and um, add any additional information that they would like, fielding additional questions, uh, any additional questions from the commissioners. Um, I don't have any speaker cards tonight, but if there was anyone that wished to speak in favor or in opposition to the application, they would be invited to do so. The public portion of the meeting would be closed and the discussion would be between the applicant staff and the planning commissioners. So with that, if the applicants present, please step forward, raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter is the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Could you please state your name and address for the record? Curtis L. Hart, 8051 Terra Lane, Jacksonville, 32216. Thank you. Curtis, how are you tonight? Uh, good, Mr. Uh, Commissioner and uh, members. Uh, and as uh, Heather stated, we had previously had this approved and just time uh, got away from us. It, it's, a, it's an ideal location for transition, a transition zone. I would doubt that anybody would buy it for single family, but it, it backs up to a parking lot and uh, there's a restaurant on one side, car wash down the street. So it's heavy commercial here. Townhouse would be a nice transition between that and houses across the street. Uh, there would be three nice uh, townhomes there on First Avenue North. The property is currently vacant. Anything substantially different than what we were looking uh, at? No, sir. Okay. Any questions? Be glad to answer. 
Any questions for the applicant? What restaurant's on the other side of the It's uh, it's R Beat. R R R Beat. R Beat. Blue Moon. R Beat. R Beat. I've eaten there. I eat there, but Marlowe's Where Taco Lou's used to be. Pretty nice restaurant. Thank you. Thanks. All right, I don't have any speaker cards, and I don't think there's anyone that wish to speak in favor or in opposition. Um, any discussion? Our motion. I'll make a motion to accept. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Certain Sanders? Yes. John Scott Walker? Yes. Colleen Murphy White? Yes. Justin Learman? Yes. Greg Sutton? Yes. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Hart. Thank you. All right, Ms. Harlan, PC 2 20. PC 2 20 is a land development code text amendment application. Applicant is the Planning and Development Department, 11 North 3rd Street, Jacksonville Beach, Florida, 32250. And the request is for LDC text amendment approval to amend various, various text in the article, excuse me, Article 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and Article 9 of Chapter 34 of the Land Development Code. Periodically, the text of the LDC must be reviewed and amended to address needed and or desired updates and improvements. In 2001, the LDC was amended in this manner under Ordinance 2001-7810, and changes in that ordinance included text amendments to the articles listed in your staff memo. Since then, minor changes have been made to the LDC over the last 17 years as needed or requested by an applicant. Staff has been assembling the most recent package of required or desired changes over the last several years and has developed a list of amendments for consideration. The proposed amendments are attached to your um, LDC text amendment application, and I'll go over those all briefly, um, and both Bill or myself are um, able to answer any questions that you guys have, and I do have it up on the screen for a vast audience here to look at. Uh, so the first one is a typographical error uh, corrected in section 34-177, 34-179, 34063 and 503 uh, subsection 5. I believe that one was a typo in the actual section subheading. I'm going to ask that um, as we go through these, if uh, anyone has any questions, let's address it at that point before we move on. Okay, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll pause after each one and see if you guys have. Does anyone have any questions about the typos? All right, moving on. Section 34-21E1. Uh, clear is, we're providing clarification that appeals of interpretations by the Planning and Development Director may be submitted by an applicant with standing per the definition of standing and that appeals will be made to the Circuit Court of Duval County instead of to the Board of Adjustment, which is the way it's been uh, till now, taking unreasonable burden off of that lay board. Any questions on that? Can you just um, explain that for me, please? Maybe Bill. I was the only one that I had a question on. Bill May Planet. No? Yeah. Bill May Planet and Development Director, Lebanon North Third Street. <clears throat> this is uh, the 21E1 on this. Yes. Um, right now, the only route of appeal available to citizens, applicants, for uh, interpretation, for my interpretation of the Land Development Code, which is my primary function, is through the Board of Adjustment. The only addition here is that if somebody doesn't just like a particular professional interpretation of mine, they have to demonstrate that it somehow affects them in order to make it, in order to go through that appeal. And also one addition to that, the city attorney strongly suggested that we take out the definition for standing because he said standing is contextual and it depends on different circumstances because you don't want to be locked into one definition of standing. But it would be vetted any time we got an, an application for an interpretation of my, um, of the field of my interpretation, we'd a case by case figure out whether or not they've got legitimate standing or not. 
And we get very few of these type of appeals. Uh, the former director, when I was working under him for 18 years here, had one such. And in the five years I've either been acting or director, we've only had two. So um, it's, I don't, we don't feel like we're unreasonably giving people access to uh, appellate through the board, but we just thought it was so, good. So just for clarification, instead of going through board with Justin, they gotta go through the circuit court. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, so there is an option for them to still appeal. Right now, yeah, right now is it goes straight to the Board of Adjustment, then once you exhaust that local remedy, then you would go to the courts of appeal. Right. Okay. The problem with that, and the reason we're taking out the Board of Adjustment or proposing to take the Board of Adjustment out, out as a route of appeal, you have to understand that the bailiwick of what the Board of Adjustment does is make a decision based on my interpretation of the code needing a variance and they never that's never been contested it puts them in a very awkward situation when all of a sudden they're going well we don't agree with your director's interpretation of what you typically get in your variance applications because that's typically one of the in fact i think the last two we had were uh, related to variances so we're just making it go straight to the court because it puts a very hard burden on a lay board to i don't take it personally but i think they kind of feel like well what do you mean we don't want to it just seems like it puts undue pressure on the lay board. So we're recommending that it goes straight to the court. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sorry. This is I'll just stay up here for now. <laughs> Any more questions on that? Um, if not, I'll move on. Okay, to a, a lighter item, section 34-41 are some amendments or additions to our definitions. So uh, the first one is artwork. We are proposing to remove the size limitations of murals so that an entire wall can be a mural essentially, which is how it was prior to 2015. Um, that kind of slipped through the cracks, unfortunately. Um, amending the definition of carport to make it consistent with the Florida Building Code, providing a new definition of a driveway for clarification. Same thing for a lot of record, a, a clarification definition. Changing shopping center from two to three separate stores, and a new definition of walkway again for clarification. Any questions on that, or anything you want to add, Bill? Um, just a couple of things. The artwork, um, the the consulting group Dix Hike Partners has been working on our downtown <laughs> bike hiking master plan, public art master plan, lighting master plan, wayfinding signage plan, and street furnishings plan. Well, they called out a lot of blank canvas walls, if you will that would be suitable for murals, for downtown murals, we can't implement, and one of the first ones we'll do, some of the lowest hanging fruit we have is the police storage building over at the new public pit parking lot between 3rd and 4th on 2nd and North. That would be the first one, and we'd actually probably do an entire building rack with that, except for the roof. Our current science standards prevent that. When we adopted our science standards in 2015, it was based on a recognized model sign code ordinance, primarily what it did uh, for billboards for local governments. And it had in that language to murals, and quite honestly, our old sign code went from about four or five pages to 28 pages, and that, that slight definition, of including the definition of murals and limiting the 25%, we just didn't realize what the impacts of it were. So in order to implement the plan that Dick Sykes prepared for us for public art, one component of it, we need to um, eliminate that, that uh, regulation requirement. And before anybody asks if they do, any of the murals you see right now that exceed that size, like the, the sugar stroll on the north face of Taco Lou. Um, Ed Malin's got a paradise on one side of his building. He's got a little streetscape on the other side. There's an office building, uh, four, Third Avenue North, just behind what used to be Louie's. That's the beat that now. She's got a nice mural up on her wall. Green Room Brewery has the kind of space age uh, fishing lure. That's what it kind of looks like. I mean, all of those predate the code, but they're we have got enough of the compliments from the public about them, so we just think it's just going to be a little more liberating in terms of what you can do with public art. I will tell you, Sir for the Bar's murals do comply with the standard, but he had to cut down a lot of what he wanted to do for that mural, so that's just kind of where that is. Um, the other thing, Shopping Center, that came up when the ill-fated attempt for Sir for the Bar to go into the Mangoes building. Um, they got benefit of the, stat, of the development code just saying a group of buildings, which staff interpreted to be a group of buildings could be as little as two, sharing a common parking lot, then they get the requirement for a shopping center. City Council specifically requested that going forward in this next amendment package, that we increase the number of businesses sharing a common parking lot to qualify for that shopping center credit. And this is, would that be at least three? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So now Not three, three, but at least yes, three. Sir. At least three. Yes, sir. 
What's the change on the cardboard? Uh, the change on the cardboard is the number of sides. That you know, yes. Two, not three. Yes, sir. Um, did you get the one that's better? It yeah, went, yeah, got it it went from two to three is what it did. From three to two. Okay, so back off. So that's good. Yeah, this is to the door. What's the change in driveway and walkway? You can put it up see what I'm doing. It's right here, hold on. And you have to understand some of these amendments I've been babysitting for a couple of years, so I but those are both new definitions that we did that didn't exist before. And that was uh, related to litigation we had with the developer. Um, you just well recently heard the, the what we we call them the uh, sorry. We just call them the settlement agreement amendments. That was related to uh, the discussion about what type of setbacks were required between the interior um, townhouse units, and it was unclear to the attorneys what a walkway was. Was it an accessory structure? Was it part of the principal use? So we just clarified that to succinctly align with what the attorney's lack of comprehension of the former definitions were in accessory structures. And driveway? Um, driveway was the same thing, because driveways have a setback of five feet from any property line. But common sense will tell you that if you've got a driveway leading from the street to your garage, you need to be able to cross the front property line with your driveway. Well, it made common sense, but a literal interpretation could yield something otherwise. And it could make people think that, wow, I've got to get a variance if I want my driveway to cross my front property line to get to the street. So we clearly uh, delineated that in the definition. Make sense? Yeah. All right, moving on. Section 3493B. Uh, changing the appointment term for alternates on the Board of Adjustment from two years to four years, which is consistent with the other boards and the terms for members. Any questions on that? When would it start? Would it be for the current members? Um, no, sir. It would be for any new member appointed after thereafter. That's a good question. That's just for the Board of Adjustment. Yes, sir. Yeah, All the other boards are four years now, and we don't know. I don't know what the rationale was to bump those down to two years, but for whatever it was, we're just trying to make it consistent. It's easier for the city clerk's office to keep the clock when it's a consistent time frame for everybody. In our efforts to keep the boards filled. Okay. Next one is section 34, 155C2B, which is proposing to change recommendation to report. And this is in regards to um, proceedings that come before, um, I believe this is for the Planning Commission. Yeah, we had, we had run across this before. Yes, sir, yeah. actually in litigation. Because mm -hmm. what happens is it was putting staff up as the prime mm -hmm. witness for the plaintiff versus the city as a defender. Right. Uh, specifically the Church of Our Savior issue that we had. We ended up going to federal court. I, pretty much put me in the position of being a star witness for the plaintiff. And it's not that we don't make a, if we feel it's appropriate to make a recommendation to you on a potential condition that might be applicable to a variance or a conditional use, we will do that, but it just eliminates the mandate for us to do that. The next one, I'm gonna tell you about that one anyway. Um, some of, I think Greg actually was the only person that was here in the 2018. This package generally came through the Planning Commission, was recommended for approval in 2018, and it got derailed at City Council due to some late minute lobbying in, in, my, in my mind. So these are all being reintroduced again, the same package. This is a new item. This is something that was adamantly recommended by our new city manager as soon as he came on board because I think we were actually doing a privately sponsored LDC text amendment. And he had just he stated with me unequivocally a couple of times since then, this is the only community he's ever been in where a lay citizen could individually apply to amend the text of the code. We still, we want to keep in there the ability for a property owner to rezone his property to PUD. He ought to have that right. But just because he says, well, you know, I think the code says we ought to have two trees and not five, unless there's really a general overriding onus to do that, he ought to go through the route of lobbying, coming to the Planning Commission, making his case, talk to his individual district council person, fill out a speaker card at a council meeting. That's the appropriate way for a lay citizen to come in and amend the text of the LDC. And actually, I, I agree with this position. He was, he was very adamant about it when he came on board. So my point was that was not part of that 2018 package. 
Thomas Hearing was sitting there not on board at that time. Uh, that number? 283. We, uh, we did 34203, so we're on 34207. Oh, sorry. Um, which, again, same thing as as previously, changing recommendation to report, and this is in regards to, I'm sorry, I've got my pages off here, for zoning atlas and code amendment changes under that section. But same same concept as what Bill explained previously by changing recommendation to report. Actually, the next amendment's the exact same thing. It's everywhere we change recommendation to report, it just follows through with this 16 language to make sure it's all consistent. The next two, actually, mm -hmm. section 222. Uh, 283, before it's uh, added variance, may not be requested for relief from maximum building height, residential density, or minimum lot area requirements. And again, that just restates what's already in effect now. But again, anytime I get a heated discussion or an ongoing discussion from an applicant or from their legal representation, if it's not clear to the public, I try to make it clear to them. So there's no reason in restating what these requirements are. It doesn't add any new regulation. This, uh, the next one is, uh, well, actually this next one, the section 336, 37, 38, 39, and 40. Those four, those five zoning districts are our residential districts. Two of them are multi, three of them are multifamily, two of them are single family. This was done at the request of the former city manager. Um, in the last couple of years he was here, he knew I was keeping this kind of the bucket list of what amendments we needed to come up with. He was very adamant that essential public services be permitted where they need to go, which is the underground, just the, the, couple, the public services you don't see, water, storm, water, sewer, and it's defined in the code. There's a distinction between essential public service and government use. Government use could be this building, it could be a library, it could be a school. Those remain in the categories where they are, whether they're permitted or listed. We're just changing it so essential public services hey, if there's a list station that physically has to go here, it shouldn't require public vetting to make sure that it goes in the only place it can go. And that was, again, that was initially brought up by the former city manager, and that amendment was also supported by the new city manager. Just back real quick, Bill, on sure. 283. Yes, sir. Um, are we saying there that um, the variance is not, would not redefine those things? Yes, sir. We're, we're, not, we're not saying that those things cannot, that you cannot, apply for relief no, on that, that's what it's saying is you cannot apply for you cannot apply for a variance for maximum building height citywide is capped at 35 feet there's not even a vehicle to apply for that um, residential density residential density is set in our comprehensive plan not our zoning code so you could actually apply for something and unless we were if we were off our a game or something you could probably try to get an amendment in the code based on lot size that was in plan based with the comprehensive plan and minimum lot area is the same thing. The minimum lot area is a function of density, so. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay, 39 and 40, 339 and 40, add single family dwellings for RS3 standards to the list of permitted uses in RM1 and RM2 districts. This has come up maybe in a couple of concept plan applications that y'all have heard, but more so it's come up for variance applications that the board has heard, and it's for the type of development product much like was approved tonight, the concept plat for the three unit townhouse. The, the frustration of people in the surrounding area when they come to these hearings in opposition to some of these proposals, they're like, well, we know our property zoned RM1 or RM2, we know it's zoned multifamily, but we've had this house here, this was my mother's house, these single family houses have been this enclave for years, and the argument back was, and it was a valid argument, was that well, even though they've been there for years, you're in a multifamily district, these uses aren't permitted by rights. So basically, it's out of here. You're in the conditional use. Yes, sir, yeah, exactly. So what we did was, we just restated and elevated single family homes instead of being conditional uses in the district, to now also allow them by right to try to recognize some of these older single family portions of some of our multifamily neighborhoods. Um, so if, if somebody went in and um, raised a single family dwelling or two, um, they could rebuild a single family dwelling without conditional use? Yes, sir, without coming to you first. Okay. Now, if they needed variances, we're not changing the dimensional standards, because if you do single family RM1 or RM2, it's still subject to the RS3 standards. So that would still require a variance if they would meet it, but it's just one less stop shopping. It would take some applications from your docket on an annual basis. 
Well, not, we refer to these single family multi family items. We, I mean, you've been, you've been on the board long enough, you've heard your share of them, but it's, it's, it's not, and the, we're out of land, and land values are coming up so much, people are typically buying for multi family purposes in the multi family districts. But again, we thought it was appropriate to recognize the validity of single family and these little single family enclaves to not only exist, but to continue if, they, if people want to go forward and continue single family there. Uh, the next one, 34, 345, B19, that's a technical correction. Um, the people at uh, the Art Master Plan and everything, the Dix Height Group, that was preceded by the work that did all the downtown streetscape. Well, when they did that work, they also came up with a set of site design standards for our downtown area, and we put them into the land development code. What I neglected to do was forget that there was an underlying citation in the Central Business District, whereas if you got approval to do multifamily, it was for the R and Q standards. The new site design standards we incorporated into our code have standards for multifamily development, and I just didn't pick up on that at the time. So this is really a, to, uh, correct an error on my part several years ago. That's why it's been on the books for a while. And it's not radically different. What it does is that like the site design and lot layout standards for the central business district were designed to pull people to the streets, whereas the R and Q zoning standards, you gotta have a minimum setback of 20 feet. So it just, if you're going to pull everything to the street in downtown, you want to pull multifamily as well. So that's the intent behind that. Hmm. I'll get back to you. Can you go? Yeah, 37. <laughs> okay, the next one is 34, 373, um, providing a definition of wheel strips. And that would basically where, they're, where we're measuring from and how wide they need to be, and also providing for um, bicycle parking. When off street parking lots contain 10 or more spaces, one parking space may be converted into a bicycle parking area. And the wheel strips are just because that's one way you can cut down on lot coverage. And without having a standard for that, we want to make sure we can accommodate vehicles without people going crazy. We're trying to put narrow bicycle tire size wheel strips. So we came up with a, stop, a common standard. We measure seven feet from the outside wheel to the outside wheel. And uh, a parking space in our city has to be nine by 17. So it basically gives you about a foot of clear zone for your doors to open on a point I'm sorry to uh, open the car doors, and the, the wheels gotta be 18 inches wide. And I literally went out one day in the parking lot and probably measured 15 different car, truck, tiny car, big car setups, and they all fit within those parameters. So you can, all, you can make the wheel strips bigger, but in no case can you get smaller than this. And the other one was just a kind of a prop up for what's happened informally in a lot of our big parking lots. They wanna put a bike rack in, they don't have any landscape area to do it, so they'll basically usurp a parking space, but if a parking space is to put into a bike rack or five or six bikes, you already provide more capacity. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a no-brainer. Uh, and one more under that section, I apologize, I missed, is to add language to clarify that vehicular access to required parking must also be paved in addition to the parking that is required to be paved. That's that, that. Would you make a motion? No, I, it, it was on here, I just forgot to mention it under, under section uh, 373. It's right after bicycle parking standards on page 10. On the next page. Right? Yeah, that was another practical. I mean, if we require parking to be paid, it's, and to me, it was implicit that any access to it had to be paid as well. But that's another one that we now explicitly state. Okay. Uh, next one is 
that specifically came up in discussion with an attorney representing a private property owner. It's where the old Jazzercise used to be mm -hmm. on Fourth? Third? Fourth. Fourth Avenue North and First Street, Jazz, which is now the um, Mr. Allen, the, the gentleman that bought Zenith Galleries, tore down the building next to Lynch's, put up that new spec restaurant. They went to the map with me on, no, you measure those site visibility lines out at the edge of the street pavement, not at the property line. I'm like, no, sir, you don't. I showed you different examples downtown where we made people chant for the, either pull their building back or chant for the first floor. And if you look at that building, the new spec building where the jazzercise was, now you'll see it's got this nice, the entry door is chamfered to the corner, so your, your pedestrian traffic opens right up to the corner, but it pulls it off the street. And actually the architect gave me credit for helping improve the design of this building by going to the mat, I'll know this is a definition of where the site visibility travel was. You got too many other situations if you measured out in the street. Sometimes you'd have an intervening sidewalk, sometimes it wouldn't be a curved street. So pulling it back to the property line is consistent with the way we've been interpreting it for 20, my 26 years here. Uh, Bill, I just noticed that going back to uh, 392A1, I don't see it on page 10 of the ordinance. If it's on another page, that you're aware of, it might just be missing. Um, so we just keep that in mind. All right, the next one is 34, I apologize, I'm not here. 999, I not think is accurate. Um, adding internet websites and social media to the list of prohibited locations where home occupations can be advertised. Currently, the code basically just states I can't advertise it in, in the um, newspaper or radio or TV, but we all know there's other avenues that people are advertising their businesses currently. We want to make sure we reflect the current trends there. So that's actually section 399, not 999. That's good. I was just looking at that. That's a typo. Yeah, sorry about that. The next one is section 34, 444 under signs. Adding that signs on fences or perimeter walls are prohibited, and this is in addition to prohibited signs already for trees and other vegetation. And that's specifically to address an existing ongoing situation we have on Fender Road. What about if there's a uh, handicap sign on the wall for that for parking places? That would be below the standard requirements for signs that require a permit, and I believe it's regulatory and instructive, so it's exempt from that standard, from the sign standard. Like telling signs wouldn't be allowed? Pardon? Like telling signs? Yes, sir. Well, actually, yeah. In fact, if it's on the perimeter of your wall, typically your wall or fence is on the edge of your property line. So if you're trying to regulate parking out in the public right of way, which a lot of people do, it's totally unenforceable. But you'll see it. And if it's below a certain size, we don't regulate it because it's not necessarily an illegal sign. It's just the action you're promoting is not, you can't back it up because you're trying to tow people off of public property. But that being said, it's an interesting say, point. Pardon? I said that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought They're of that. Yes, they are. are. I, I, I comment. I'll stop and tell people. I said, "Hey, you know that's not enforceable." And if I'm in, if I got a city shirt on, they they kind of take it. But if they don't, if I'm not wearing a city shirt, if I'm out here on the weekend, they just tell me to yeah. you know, go walk away. <laughs> just like that. Yeah, go walk. <laughs> yeah, not that polite. We should just do what I do. My sign says the last car that parked here is still missing. <laughs> that's see, that's creative. It's not a threat. It's just creative. <laughs> All right, well, the last one is um, under contents of application for a final plat requiring five copies instead of ten, just to reflect what the actual need for review is. And answer any questions you guys have going back. And again, just for the other people on the board, Greg knows, um, when we do land development code text amendments or zoning amendments, this, the planning commission sits as a land planning agency for the city and makes a recommendation to council. So even if for this one or any of the two of them we're going to talk about next, even if you come up with a recommendation for denial, it would still go to city council. It just goes with your recommendation. Mm -hmm. That's all we got for that. All right. One. Discussion? I don't know that we need any since we went through them so thoroughly. I appreciate that. Part of our motion. I, I have a question. Where yes. are we with we are, I believe, 2020 is when we're due to make the determination about whether or not we have to do a state-mandated evaluation and appraisal report. It's called the EAR. 
Um, that the tasking of that EAR is simply for us to do the, the staff initially to do the determination as to whether or not our existing comprehensive plan has caught up with any statutory changes since the last time we did an amendment like that. The last time we did the EAR was in 2007, and that's when the 2010 plan became the 2030 plan. And I will tell you that whether or not politically the city council planning commission wants to do an, uh, a voluntary update of the comprehensive plan, that statutorily we have, we have followed. Last year we did the water supply facilities element that was required by state mandate, and there's a new state mandate, state mandate out right now that we address uh, coastal resiliency, and we're in the process of doing that. With uh, I don't know if any I don't know if any of the other public workshop we had we had initial findings. Yeah, Margaret was here. Margaret Morning on your board was here. But we're going through that process right now, and we imagine April or May will probably bring proposed language addressing coastal resiliency back to the Planning Commission and to the City Council for recommendation for inclusion in the plan. And at that time, I believe, is when we'll have a discussion about whether or not different people think that the entire plan needs to be reevaluated. And I'll tell you one thing that's actually really good for the city. When I started working here in 94, um, the comprehensive plan then, was it the 2010 plan? I think it was. They were, all, all the elements were built on city build out population wise of about 32,000 people. And I can tell you factually right now, we're at 236, 237, and we're almost built out. So the fact is, it's good for us because back in 2010, all of the facilities elements were going, hey, this is based on a water demand of 27, sewer generation of 27, or excuse me, 32,000 solid waste generation of 32,000. So the comprehensive plan back then set all those levels for that anticipated development. Well, we're filling the we're filling the cup faster or slower than we thought we would, number one. Number two, the cup's gonna be smaller. So public facility-wise that we have control over, we are in a very good, we're in very good shape for our levels of service. Parks, you know, we didn't even credit the public beach as, as an oceanfront park. Without that, even our private parks per capita, we're doing final parks and recreation. Uh, we defer to the Duval County Public Schools for the school planning. We inform them of any big residential projects. We have to put them in the planning mix, and Heather or I either go to the, the school board planning red, uh, advisory committee meetings when they have those. So I don't know. I'm not sure what the answer is if we're going to do a wholesale amendment or a wholesale evaluation appraisal when it comes up due in 2020, or if we'll say we as a city feel it's adequate, we may embark on our own voluntary updates after that. So it's, it's, that's a topical question. Over the next probably seven, eight months, you'll, you'll hear a little more discussion about that. <clears throat> Any further discussion on a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Motion to second. Roll call vote, please. Justin Merriman? Yes. Colleen Murphy White? Yes. John Scott Walker? Yes. Britton Sanders? Yes. Greg Sutton? Yes. Ernest Ireland, PC 3 20. PC 320 is a, another land development code text amendment. Applicant Planning and Development Department, 11 North 3rd Street, Jackson Beach, Florida, 32250. And the request is for a LDC text amendment approval to amend the text in section 34, 406 to allow six foot tall fences in front yards of properties in residential zoning districts at front state road A1A, 3rd Street. This amendment is being proposed by the city council for consideration at the request of a homeowner who lives at 3477 South 3rd Street. The homeowner installed a six foot tall wooden fence in the front yard of the subject property without obtaining a fence permit, which also extended into the FDOT right of way in front of her property. The fence was installed behind an existing tall augustrum hedge planted by a previous owner of the property also in the FDOT right of way. The property was cited by code enforcement in July of 2018 for installing a fence without a permit. The existing six foot tall fence cannot be permitted by the Planning and Development Department under current zoning regulations due to its location and the required front yard setback of the property and also off of the homeowner's private property in the State Road A1A right of way. The placing of any structure, including a fence, within the State Road A1A 3rd Street right of way would require approval from FDOT. 
Conversely, if the fence were to be relocated into the front yard of the subject property along the front property line, it could only be permitted to a maximum height of four feet. There are several reasons why front yard fences are restricted to four feet in height. The primary reason is to allow for passive drive-by surveillance of buildings on developed property by law enforcement. Another reason is to aid in address location by emergency responders. And finally, the regulation of front yard fences at any specific height is to promote a general consistency in appearance from property to, to property that front on any given street or avenue. Given that the residentially zoned properties fronting 3rd Street are almost totally developed, an amendment to allow higher front yard fences for properties with front yards facing 3rd Street would benefit only a few properties. Mm -hmm. The homeowner has presumably modified their existing fence to comply with the code enforcement order and the existing Lagustrum hedge remains in front of the property. This is only the third request for additional fence height and a front yard setback area for a property fronting on 3rd Street in over 20 years. The other two requesters, one of which was from the inquirer's immediate neighbor to the south, were cited for a legal fence installation in the general time frame in 2018 that the owner of 3477 South 3rd Street was cited. Both of those property owners have since modified their fences to bring them into compliance with the current four foot maximum height for fences and front yards. Finally, given that the property at 3477 South 3rd Street is 54 feet wide across the front property, uh, front property line of the lot, that the existing driveway from the house out to 3rd Street is approximately 17 feet wide at the front property line, and that the driveway is required to have a 10-foot site visibility triangle on either side of it, with nothing allowed within the triangle above two and a half feet in height, if a six-foot tall fence were to be permitted across the front property line, there would still be required to be a 37-foot wide open gap in the fence to accommodate the driveway and its two sight triangles. That would leave a total of only 17 feet of front property line that could contain the desired six-foot tall fence. And Bill or I will be happy to answer any questions for you on this. Mr. Mayne, I have a couple questions on this. If you don't mind. No, sir. Not at all. Can you, or maybe you know, what was the reason why the property owner needs a six-foot fence in front of their house? Uh, they cited for noise and privacy. Okay. That was it? Yes, sir. Thank you. Ms. Ireland, you said the... Um, stated in here that they have um, come into order? Actually, through the, I'm sorry, Bill Mead, Planning and Development Director. Um, I checked after I wrote the memo, I wrote this memo, after I wrote the memo, they have come to compliance. So they are in compliance, as you can't tell, because it's behind a six foot fence. So they're in compliance, compliance with the height, or are they also out of the state right away? No, sir, I didn't address that, and I did not address that with FDOT. Uh, and your opinion, are they out of the state right away? No, sir. Okay. Well, it's, 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 the properties are right across the street from Palms Presbyterian. It's, they, they're the only two 12-foot Lagustrum mm -hmm. hedges. It, that property and the neighbor next door, the neighbor next door just did not choose to do a fence. I guess they were just happy with the hedge, and I wasn't willing to make an issue of it, but I didn't feel it was appropriate to try to ratify a code enforcement case with a settlement amendment. So a couple questions. So they have, sure. a, they have like a rolling fence that they open every time that they no, park? No, sir. They don't even have a gate. They didn't have a gate. No, sir. But the Lagustrum edge that they do have is in violation of the site triangles as well, I, personally. But I will tell you that both of the properties that have those tall hedges have made a uh, like a hammerhead turn area so they don't have to back out into the right. I, I'd be scared of that turn back out of either one of those properties. So to the extent that they want privacy, privacy and a little sound attenuation, they've got it with the existing hedge. This one property owner just decided to backfill it with a six-foot fence behind it. And she did actually come in and get a permit for the correct height fence, and she knows where she could put the correct height fence. I just do know she did cut the six foot fence down to four feet, but to my knowledge, she hasn't taken it out of the right way. I, I don't like going on private property to try to, I'm trying to respect private property rights. But this was cons this was discussed. This whole issue was discussed. I actually wrote a white paper on it for council a year or so ago, and it was discussed in the council briefing, and the council briefing the council. Just decided they wanted to charge staff because we'll prepare the application and we'll just consider it through the proper process. Sure. That's all I got. Unless there's any other questions. Is it is it the house where the new house is just now being built? There was one on the corner that looks like a No, actually that one, the, the one that the, the red roof house, 
Yeah. Let's get, no, that house next to it, when I start, when I wrote the first version of this, that was still a vacant property. I right. took that reference out because now that property is developed. But you can imagine the impact of putting a six foot fence across. And so what I told you, if it's a two car driveway, it's 16 feet wide, which I, I can't remember if that house has a two car garage or not. But you got 16 feet, then you got to put a 10 foot side triangle on either side of it. That's 20. That's 36 feet on a 50 foot lot. So that leaves 14 feet. You can put two little seven foot wide, six foot kicks. But other than that, the middle of your property is still wide open. That property you're talking about, that right next to it is a six foot fence, right where the driveway is going to be. Yeah, and it's their side yard. Because you're right. If you see six foot fences on A1A, it's because most of the avenues have lots that a lot butt up each other. They share rear yards. So when you get out to a street end, whether it's third or second or first, the fence you see is a side yard fence. What's, well, the, what's the limit on a side yard fence? Six feet if it's okay, and you can go from you can go to eight feet if you keep the area between six and eight feet at least twenty five percent open. You know, so normally. what's that house just south of the one we're talking about? What are they going to do because they got a six foot fence on the north side? Well, but because that fence is there, their driveway and by the zoning, the, the fence will be set should be set at least ten feet off that fence, which will respect the site driving. So in other words, your driveway will have to be at least ten feet south of that six foot. Yes, sir. And that's the required, that's the difference for street corners, like I told you in the restaurant example, those site triangles at street corners are 20 feet. And Public Works generally projects that site triangle across private property out of the right way to keep people from parking out. Everybody knows they've got their own pet uh, situation in town where you go up and it's just totally blind. That's the whole purpose of the site triangles is to prevent that kind of blind access. You get some of the kids on bikes and skates. And Any other discussion or do I have a motion? Uh, through the chair, I, I actually have a, I have a problem with this just based on, uh, I understand that this is just for uh, property slot on A1A, but I feel if we open this up, it could set a precedence for other properties in other areas like Pimmon Road. I um, also have a big issue with the safety, which is the biggest thing. Uh, so I'd like to make a motion to deny this application based on public safety. Second all. I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote. A yes vote is in favor of the denial. John Scott Walker? Yes. Britton Sanders? Yes. Colleen Murphy White? Yes. Justin Learman? Yes. Greg Sutton? Yes. All right, Ms. Ireland, PC 4 20. Last one, PC 4-20 is another Land Development Code text amendment. Applicant is Planning and Development Department, 11 North 3rd Street, Jacks Beach, Florida, 32250. And the request is for LBC text amendment approval, amending the text in section 34, 346B to add mobile food vending vehicles to the list of permitted uses in industrial I-1 zoning districts. Staff was approached by a representative of the Veterans of Foreign Wars Post 3270, the VFW on 9th Street, and a food truck operator seeking approval to operate the food truck at the post located on 9th Street South in an I-1 zoning district. Pursuant to Ordinance 2014-8042, food trucks are currently permitted uses only in C1, C2, CS, CBD, and in RD zoning districts and PUD zoning districts that existed on January 1st of 2014, excuse me, to clarify, commercially area uh, PUDs. When Ordinance 2014-8142 was drafted in 2014, it was not contemplated that food truck operators would want to locate in the industrial areas of the city. Two public workshops were held on the subject matter, and the desire to allow food trucks in I-1 zoning districts was not identified as a priority at that time. Staff has been directed by City Council to draft an ordinance to add mobile food vending vehicles to the list of permitted uses in the industrial I-1 zoning district. If approved, applicants would be required to adhere to the same process as food trucks in all other locations provide and provide property owner authorization, proof that the food truck meets the criteria established by Ordinance 2014-8041, and a site plan showing the proposed location of the vehicle on the site. Staff has no objections to adding mobile food vending vehicles to the list of permitted uses in the I-1 zoning district. I'm happy to answer any questions. Can 
I have one comment, Bill Main Planning Director, excuse me, 11 North 3rd Street. The reason these two ordinances fall separately from that amendment package is their sole purpose ordinances, and this initial staff application with all those facets were just custodial in nature. They were brought up by staff, and we just um, we brought them together as a package. These other two amendments were specifically requested for different reasons by City Council. For the entertainment of both amendments, amendments for, uh, both by City Council, so that's why we kept them separate. That's it. Unless you have questions. I I'm new, so this might be a not smart question. So the question I have is, are there any residential areas next to the I-1 zoning district? They're not adjacent to. There are residential areas across 9th Street. 9th Street's a 25-mile street, but it's one of our major collectors, so it's a fairly busy road. But no, there's no immediately adjacent residential zone neighbors to our I-1 properties. And actually, this, this was done at the request of BFW, but there's a brand new set of warehouses going in at the south dead end of 10th Avenue South, 10th Street South. And two of the tenants in there are, one is a, a cheerleading facility and one's a gymnastics facility. The property owner has already said, well, would that positively affect my property as well? And the answer is yes, it would. There's a one gymnasium that's called, a, or a, a, yeah, a workout, a gym. A gym. It's back in there that's expressed the interest too. So I mean, it'll positively affect some other people. And I honestly don't see the downside. I just didn't anticipate people wanting to go in the district with a food truck. Yeah, and Bill, if I could add to that, if it is uh, within 100, I think, believe it's 150 feet of uh, the property line of a residential zoning district, which could be across 9th Street, it would limit their hours to, they couldn't be open past 10. So we'd have to, again, that's on a site-by-site -site basis that we would evaluate what's nearby to see if that would impact their hours of operation. Were there, um, when we had approved this before, in the C1, C2, the, the areas that are approved now, were there specific locations that were approved for uh, operation of the of the um, of the trucks? Yeah. Well, there were. There's different standards between restaurants, adjacent restaurants, and as she said, different residential uses, and that's what we apply administratively. That's not something after that to a board. We just that's why we require scale site plan. Yeah, it seems like I'm recalling some sort of limitation. Yeah. That was. One was previously for, approved. I think one's for a restaurant if not right. on the same site, because I mean, if you're a restaurant owner and you want to get a food truck on your property, well, I'm not going to challenge that. But you don't want to necessarily have a food truck set up in a bank's property that's within 20, 30 feet from a from a brick and mortar restaurant right. based property. Right. Right. And same thing with proximity to residential right. proximity. We kept the distance far enough to be not just the street, but a little further in the street. So I think it is 150 feet. So we do have distance. And that would apply. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. It doesn't change that at all. Discussion? Or do I have a motion? Motion to approve. I'll second the motion. I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Brenda Sanders? Yes. John Scott Walker? Yes. Colleen Murphy White? Yes. Justin Learman? Yes. Greg Sutton? Yes. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but we don't have a meeting in February. Well, we would have if we had received an application by Friday. These agendas are done before that time, so we did not get any applications in. So maybe I'll see you all in March. For either. <laughs> There's no, yeah, we didn't get any applications in, so um, I'm just going to make stuff up to get you all here. But you know where to find us if you have any questions in the meantime, and if we have a meeting in March, which I suspect we will, you guys will get a packet in the mail. March 9th. I could be out like my kids. It would be the 9th. It is spring break for Duval County. You are correct. Okay. March 9th is? Yeah, March 9th. Yeah, that week. The second week in March is spring break for Duval County. The one before that, I think, is St. John's. Spring break is DBC week. I usually try to leave when it's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys.